Okay, welcome back everybody. <clears throat> um, you probably saw my Piazza post, but uh, no problem set this week. Just a weird week. I, we had lots of anguish on the, oh, come on. Uh, yeah, good. So that's, so uh, we do have the project proposals due a week from Friday. So please use the time, to, you know, in the, in the office hours and the, or right before class or right after class to come talk to us about Project ideas, um, I think that's, that's great. We want to hear your ideas. We want to give you feedback. We'll give you feedback in the project proposal um, process. OK, so <clears throat> thematically, I organized this, uh, this chunk of the lectures about around this clutter clearing um, idea, right, of that system that we've been looking at for a little while now. And we have a sort of full stack simulation that we've been building up to, which loads slowly even on Ethernet. Okay. But we've talked in the context of clutter clearing. You know, we're setting this up with random initial conditions. We talked about how to do that. We talked about a lot about the simulation that goes on beneath it, okay. But given some setup that the code that starts with random initial conditions, we're gonna drop a bunch of objects in the bin. Then we're gonna do some point cloud processing. Right, our simulated scene has cameras pointing down in the bin. Three cameras looking at the same objects. We need to, you know, crop. The, the bin out of, this, out of the scene and the other cameras out of the scene. We need to estimate normals. We need to merge the point clouds. Right? All, these, all these things we talked about. Okay. And then we talked about grasp selection. With the heuristic that we built up to last time using a metric based on ant antipodal grasps. Right? We're going to not depend explicitly on estimating the pose of any object or having a model of any object. We're just going to look for nice flat spaces with normals putting, looking in the opposite direction that our hand can fit around. And that's a surprisingly good way to pick up a lot of different objects. Okay, And then we fall back to the things we did before. So then we can make a basic um, keyframe sketch. to end effector trajectories. And then we send that to our differential IK controller. And that's most of what's happening in this simulation, right? But there's one big piece that we haven't sort of talked about yet. And that's, you know, what do you do when you get to the end of this? That's going to move one object, okay? And then you have to do something else. You know, loop is the simplest version of that, but um, what if there's no more objects in the first bin? Then we have to switch and move the pipeline over to the second bin. What happens if you picked something up and you accidentally dropped it, okay? You don't want to just go blindly through. You want to stop and pick it up again, okay? So there's actually even in this simple demo, there's some high-level machinery that's coordinating these different parts of the process and updating those, those, that coordination based on the real-time sensor input. And that's what we're talking about with programming the task level of, the, of this behavior. Okay? So I want to go through and, um, and tell you some of the basic ideas from sort of task-level planning and execution today. Okay? And um, I find that, that it's, it's helpful maybe to start with just contrasting the way we typically program at the task level and program in, in general in the systems framework or in any sort of simulation-based workflow or robotics-based workflow. It's different than the way you would normally write code. Okay, so how many people know what I mean when I say procedural code? 
Okay? There's the way you normally write code is actually most of you probably are writing procedural code. So you'll write a big chunk of code that maybe says, you know, while true, and then I'll sort of, you know, if there's objects in the first bin, then do something, you know, and then maybe if there's objects, whatever, and, and I can write sort of standard control flow that uses, you know, potentially branching logic and, and loops and other things to sort of stage to describe what I want the system to do. If I were to just say I'm going to do all these things and then loop back, that's actually a procedural coding strategy, which is by far the most common thing. But, I mean, I remember the first time when I was an undergrad, I started writing computer graphics code, right? And when you start, as soon as you start writing computer graphics code, you realize that there's, um, you don't get to write code like this, typically, right? There's actually, at the heart of a computer graphics code, is a render loop. Is it still going, right? Yeah. Or did I drop something? Yeah. It does that. And that's, uh, we'll actually understand that today, like how to test that, okay? But in a, in a standard computer graphics pipeline, let me just write computer graphics pipeline. This is just the first time I saw it. There's this loop that's super important, which is the render loop, right? Right, at the, there's certainly this sort of while true loop going through and then you know, basically on every pass through this, you have to decide what you want to draw. And then you need to call render and send that to the GPU or, you know, to your graphics processing. And this loop needs to run at, I don't know, 33 frames, 32 frames a second, right? Uh, so decide what you want to draw. It can't be execute this long running, you know, multi-second behavior. Should I, I should probably stop that. It's distracting, isn't it? I'll pause it here. Although that was one of the cases that we'll talk about in a minute. Okay. So if I stick in the middle here something that says execute this, the following behavior for the next two seconds, that breaks my render loop, right? I, I need to send a command to the, to the screen at, at 32 frames a second, let's say. Um, right? And this is a different way to program. How do you change your, your control flow that it's tempting to write like this into something that is always available to have an answer for what you should, and this is the same thing is true in robotics, right? So we have low-level controllers and a low-level simulator that needs to send commands to the motors at, you know, 100 hertz, let's say. Maybe kilohertz if you're doing more dynamic control. Let's say 100 hertz, okay? You have to have an answer available every, at every 100 hertz. You don't get to say, do this for a while, do this for a while, unless you build a bridge between that slower execution and the faster execution, okay? So it demands a little bit of thought about how you connect those two. And I would say there's kind of three broad classes of how people change the way they write the, the higher level code because of that demand, okay? The first way people do it is they still write procedural code. but in a separate process or thread, okay? So maybe I have my while, you know, if object pick up object, you know, this is the the, you know, two seconds, second behavior, something, okay, something long running here. And I have a, I could write a script that sort of goes like this and uses the standard control flow word we know about. And I write this in process number one, let's say, like a different program. I'm going to run multiple programs on my computer, okay. And then I'll have my 
my other program, which is going to be the simulator, the low-level control. Maybe this has my FIK in here. This has my hardware station sim. And probably there's another system here that has to do the interface, okay? And then <clears throat> I break the temporal abstraction. This is running at 100 hertz or a kilohertz or whatever you need to do to simulate or do your low-level control. And this is running at whatever pace the task demands. And you send messages back and forth, which would be, let's say, robot plan here. And maybe this is sending constant streams of robot state camera images. <clears throat> and in that way, people do, you know, they have, say, right before I pick up my object, I'll look at my cameras, I'll see if there's anything in there, and then I'll decide to pick things up or not. That can totally work, okay? And, that's, and in fact, it's very common these days to write code like this because uh, we have ROS and other network interfaces that make, make it common to run multiple processes on your computer while you're running these things, and, and that all works. Okay, but you have to understand that something that we had to, something subtle is happening here in that exchange, right? This is like a message passing interface that is abstracting away time, and you lose something by doing that. If you're not careful, if you're not precise about the timing that happens across that channel, then it becomes a much more complicated, typically non-deterministic uh, system. Okay, just to finish my thought about this, this little shim, typically you'd have some, some, some system here, like um, people often call it a plan runner, right, that would listen, that would, every time it got executed, it would just check if there's a message with a new plan, if, it's, if there's a new plan, it takes into memory that new plan, and then on every time step, it outputs the current place in that plan. Right? We current, already in our existing workflow, uh, we generated a plan, we put it in a trajectory source, and then we evaluate the trajectory source at every time, and it rolls out the plan. Okay? This would be a, a comparable thing, but it's just listening for a message that takes the plan in and then executes it. But there's always some sort of machinery in there to break the time abstraction. Yeah? So um, you can do this things, I mean, so the reason I recommended, I wrote it as two different processes is that doing multi-threaded things in Python is kind of a mess. It's not really, uh, I mean, you can do async IO tricks to, to make that work. But I think conceptually it's clean to think about it as separate processes. And that's common actually in practice. Okay, so that can definitely work. But it breaks the signals and system abstraction. You know, having this and having it be in multiple processes and having the, the synchronization between here, um, it breaks the signals and systems abstraction. If you want to stay in this sort of sig signals and systems abstraction where you've carefully decla declared your timing semantics and the relationship of information flow, okay, then you can, you'll have stronger algorithms for it, but you have to write your code a little bit differently. So I'd say the second big way people do, do this is they write, um, I'd say, task policies. Okay, I'll call it like that. typically in the form of a finite state machine. Or a behavior tree. Or a similar construct. Okay, I'll tell you about those. We're going to spend some time thinking about the finite state machine version of this. And just to forecast ahead where we're going, the third sort of common way, when you 
I mean, finite state machines are hard to write for really complicated systems. So you'll often graduate to task planning. And we'll talk about the different tools from that. And if you integrate that with online replanning, then you can put a task planner into the signals and system abstraction and the feedback loop, okay? So I want to dig in a little bit to these, you know, slightly different paradigms for writing procedural, like procedural code, but in, the, in a more robot -y way, okay? So let's think about writing a finite state machine for this simple task. In fact, that's what I did in that example. Is I wrote a finite state machine, okay? And I'll do it by example. So what would be a finite state machine for this clutter clearing? In fact, you know, the one I implemented looks roughly like this, okay? So it starts off in the initial conditions in a wait for objects to settle because my random initialization code drops objects out of the sky. If you take a point cloud before things are on the, on the ground, then the robot gets very confused, okay? So First state is just wait a second, let things settle, okay? And then it starts looking to see if there's, if there's an object that could potentially grasp in the X bin or if there's an object that could potentially grasp in the Y bin, okay? And as long as it finds, so once it transitions into whichever one it finds first, okay, then it will be in this picking from X bin state and it'll stay in this state and continue to sort of detect a possible grasp, detect a possible grasp, um, or if it replan, if it if detect a failed grasp, it'll actually replan and, tr and try again, okay? And then <clears throat> um, if it runs out of, if it can't find a viable grasp in this picking from X bin state, then it goes to this picking from Y bin state, and vice versa, it goes back. If it really eventually drops all the bins, objects out of the, uh, you know, I didn't actually code this one up because I didn't ever wait it that long, but if there's a chance that it could eventually drop all the objects out of the bin, that would be unlucky and unfortunate and take a long time probably, but you could eventually be done, I guess. Um, <clears throat> but the thing that does happen, and I think that you were all laughing at when I was talking, was that uh, every once in a while, the diff IK starts getting pretty funky and the robot will kind of fold in on itself and things get pretty ugly, okay? And so to make a little bit more robustness, I added this go home skill, okay, or state, where it just says, okay, this is not going well. Just go drop my Jacobian reasoning and just go into position control mode and go back to my happy place and start the whole thing again. Okay. The details of that logic are, are not the point. The point is that instead of my state being somehow in this procedural loop, and I'm just executing this, these while statements and, and, and if statements and whatever, this makes the state of the task extremely clear. There's a, a discrete state. I'm only in one of these states at a time, okay? And every time that the control loop runs through at 100 hertz or whatever it is, it's gonna evaluate what I should be doing in that current state and give an immediate answer, right? So all of the high level logic is embedded in this one discrete state in this case. And that is now compatible with the systems framework. So we have one discrete state to identify it's typically called the mode or something, there's various names for it. Okay, so how do you write that? Oh, please, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. No, this is that's uh, that's fair. So the question is, what is if something unexpected happens? So I'll show you some examples of people doing this in the real world. And basically, like the difference between my toy example and a product, right? Products use this, but they just have a lot more states, right? And they try to think of all the things that could possibly happen, and they add a state for that. Okay. I'll show you my favorite example is from Boston Dynamics. You know, where, and they they have a lot of states, and they've you know, yeah, they yeah. I, Somebody could came and push the robot or whatever. And, uh, but you can make surprisingly robust systems if you just handle all the edge cases. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the detail. I know. I, I, I don't know the detail of that. I suspect that it's it's more at the physics level of my center of mass is no longer above my. I don't think there's a. I detected a foot on my hip. <laughs> Uh, mode, but but who knows? Who knows what they're doing? Okay, so how do I author something like that? Okay, um, in I, this is in Drake, of course, but it's it would be in general something like this, right? I'm going to have a discrete state, which is just in this case an in, in enum, okay? And <clears throat> in Drake, you actually can declare in a system a discrete state. You just say declare an abstract state. I give it the initial conditions, wait for objects to settle, and then when I go around my up, update loop, okay, my update event, I can actually get the, cons the abstract state as my mode, I can do some thinking about whether it needs to change or whatever, and then I can set that state on the way out. It's, just a, it's a little bit more gross syntax to work with discrete numbers instead of continuous numbers, but it's very similar to what you've already been writing in sort of uh, continuous land. Right? So it's perfectly reasonable to declare the state of the finite state machine as state in the code. And then what, is, what happens behind the scenes there, right? So there's actually also state that describes, that can be used to describe the behavior inside each of those individual states, uh, indiv individual modes, okay? So in order to execute, right, on the transition from doing nothing to starting to do a pick, then you call a planner, you make a plan and you store that plan as state. And then as the every time you iterate through the, the picking X bin, you're just reading out the current uh, place in that trajectory. Right? So in the update, you say, for instance, if the planner was waiting for objects to settle and I, I've waited more than a second, then I'm going to go ahead and call my planner. Okay? But that happens on the transition from the waiting to settle to the, the next state. So it doesn't happen every time step. I call my plan, I make my gripper frames, I make my gripper trajectory, you know, all this, and I save that into the state. And then the next time I come around to update, if my mode is already in the, I'm picking from the X bin, then I just evaluate the gripper trajectory and I, I just look at my state and I evaluate the trajectory at the current time. Does that make sense? I know there's a lot of like, you know, Drake code there, but does the concept make sense? The, dis the state of the system is completely declared. It contains the discrete state of which task I'm executing and the continuous state necessary to execute that task. Okay. Yeah. That's a mo so there's you could imagine offloading that only to a modeling, but somewhere along the line, you need to remember the trajectory that you planned, and make that plan only on the transition. So it's natural to sort of put it all in the one in the one system. Okay. So in particular, um, that is bottled up in the the code for the clutter clearing example. I separated out this grasp selector, which is the antipodal, you know, look at the point cloud, do the point cloud processing, do the, uh, you know, the choice of antipodal grasps as a grasp selector. Every time you ask me for a grasp selection for, there's a two grasp selector systems, one a grasp selector for the, the bin number one or bin number two, okay, those are two different systems. I can, I, I wire them up into the X bin, I called it the X bin because one bin is, in positive x, the other one is in positive y. So there's a x bin and a y bin, okay? 
and those are just wired up to here. Every time the planner says, get me a grasp, then it evaluates this output port and does all that computation. But if you're not asking for the grasp, then it won't do that computation. Right? It's constantly taking the body poses of the, um, of the robot and the, the state, okay? And it's outputting the end effector command as an in instantaneous end effector command, which can be sent to diff IK. That's what's happening most of the time. Because every once in a while diff IK gets messed up, I also have the EWA position coming out, okay, and the ability to switch from diff IK mode to position control mode, which seems like, compl I, I, I was tempted to leave it out, but I thought this was actually a good example of a slightly more complicated thing that happens. You, you might change control mode while you're, um, while you're running, and that's a sort of, in, in this case, was it important to get a slightly higher level of robustness. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yep, yeah. that's inside this planning system. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. This is the system that declares that discrete state and the continuous state. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly right. So in the update, it says, if I'm in this mode, then this is the thing I'm going to execute. If I'm in this mode, but importantly, that computation that runs has to be able to answer uh, quickly, right? It has, to, it has to have an answer at every control VT. Yeah. So anything that should take longer needs to be offloaded into, um, into the creation of that state or something like this. I cheat a little bit in this particular example. If the planner takes a long time, come up with a plan. These plans are like instantaneous. Because the way the computation is organized right now, if the plan took a long time, the simulator wouldn't step. So it kind of freezes time while it's thinking. That's a luxury you can have in simulation. There's, there's a you know, natural extension of that that still fits in the framework, but I just didn't deal with that. I didn't want the code to get too complex. Right? It's pretty, pretty nice if like, every time you had to think, the world just stops for you. Right? It's funny, actually, that some robots, um, you know, if you take too long to plan, they will actually, like, melt, right? <laughs> so, you say, you know, I've seen robots that, like, someone wrote a slightly too slow planner, and then the robot started heating up, and, like, you have to buy new motors, you know? Uh, so, the mechanical engineers typically don't like the people who write big planners uh, when they burn their motors. Okay. So, why, um, why go through this trouble? This is, like, a, a slightly more awkward way to write a simple sort of control flow, right? Um, but there's, a, there's benefits from that, right? Like I said, everything is declared. The, you get deterministic outcomes. And this leads to sort of um, a stronger set of tools, right? So, oh, I forgot to say, that, yeah, my, the failure modes that I left in that state machine with, you know, I, it, with just those states, I would group them into a handful of, of sort of failure modes. I actually, my random initial conditions Every once in a while, I get really unlucky, and my objects started inside each other. I bet that's not even true anymore, because I switched to hydroelastic and, and the new solver. So that might never, I haven't seen that in a long time. Maybe I should, I should say that's not a failure anymore. But it's possible that if I, with sheer bad luck, get a random initial condition that has deep penetration, that the simulator could crash. Um, but after the initial, after the time zero, it's basically, it, w it would not crash. Um, so the motion planning we're doing is very simple, and that can get into trouble. So if I happen to pick a, um, what happens is if I happen to pick an object like right in the corner here and go to like right in this corner where it wants to basically move through its body, that's where diff IK gets pretty confused and unhappy, and that's where you, you saw that happen at least once. Okay, um, so or it could every once in a while I could get unlucky and bump the camera because I just didn't work enough at the keyframe grasps. Perception can definitely be, um, be wrong, right? Uh, all the ways we talked about the limitations of antipodal grasp, and it's fun that you kind of see some of those even in this very simple example. You'll see a double pick sometimes. You'll definitely see it pick up a big object in its corner, and it'll be going like this as it's moving, right? Every once in a while, you'll see um, basically shadow kind of effects, and it'll start grasping where there's nothing, which is 
annoying. Okay. Um, and then there's there's cases where you really need more than pick and place. Like the there could be places where the object is in the bin and you just can't get to it with your big hand. Okay. The interesting thing though is even though this system has faults, it's locked in in the signals and systems abstraction. And we could throw pretty powerful tools to find those faults. Okay. So for instance, um, like if you're if you've worked at a, a robotics engineering company for a summer internship or anything like this, right? These companies, certainly self-driving, um, not as much in manipulation, but some manipula some groups in manipulation will have this, right? Um, they write very sophisticated test suites that are doing, you know, full stack integration testing. And when it's in the systems framework like this, it's, um, you know, the fact that things are deterministic given a random seed. They can, be, they can still have random rollouts, but everything is clocked off a single random seed. You can just start hammering on this, this, these systems with you know, cloud infrastructure and simulation. You can find all the bugs, and when you find a, a counterexample, you can go back and get a beautiful reproduction, and you can fix it, possibly by adding more and more transitions in your state machine, okay, but you can fix it. Right? So when we were working on this project here, we really hammered on it, and we had a full stack simulation that was, that was running constantly. And um, you know, it was doing not only random initial positions, it was choosing random configurations of the mug. We had a, you know, all based on the initial random seed, we would generate procedural mugs, right? Like we would change the shape of the curve and the whatever, and um, we would just hammer and hammer and hammer on this thing in the cloud. And anytime it faulted, we could, we would, it would record a nice little video, and it would, you'd wake up this morning, you say, you got a fault, here's the video of what happened, and you could go back and reproduce it, and you could fix it, okay? Um, <clears throat> some of them, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a Monte Carlo simulation suite right in Drake, so you can just give it the system or the, or a factory that makes the system, okay, and you, you can just tell how many samples, and it'll just sit there and run in parallel and try to test your code. Um, one of the funniest ones, you know, some of the bugs that you get come from very subtle interactions between this high-level task-level planning and the low-level control, right? So I should say, if you're, if you're doing testing, you should always write unit tests. Don't, don't rely on integration tests to find these things. Every little system, every little block of code you write, you should write a, a unit test that checks the correctness of that. Okay, but this full-stack integration test that runs the whole diagram, that's good for testing like the subtle interactions that happen between these systems. Even if each one of them is independently acting correct, then they can still cause problems at the system level, right? And this was one of my favorite ones. So we started, um, we would antagonize the system in simulation. So you'd always try to make, um, like for autonomous cars, you don't want to drive like, uh, you know, down uh, the highway when there's no other cars. You want to you be driving like in, I don't know, downtown New Delhi all the time or like, a, or, or, you know, some sort of, crash derby, right? You want to put it in the hardest cases all the time. So in the dishwasher demo, we had like adversarial noise. I think I even have a, a uh, an animation of it. Yeah, we like, this is, our, our sensors for the dish rack were like pretty good. But we were testing it as if the sensors were terrible because there was a small chance at any one time that they could be bad. Okay, and the super funny thing that sort of came out was that there was a chance you could, the robot could get in a loop where basically it would pick up a mug, start putting it in the rack. The perception of the rack being shifting around like this would, by the time the, before the mug would actually get into the rack, it would have at least one sample where it looked like the rack was closed because there was kind of a threshold on whether the dishwasher was open. So it'd be like, okay, and it would go set it down. Okay, but then by the time it set it down, there was some sample that was when it was open. And it would just sit there going all day long, <laughs> like, okay, it's open, no, it's closed, no, it's open, it's closed, right? And that was a super, like every piece was acting correctly, but the integration was bad, right? And it takes, you know, more sophisticated test harnesses to be able to do this, right? So it started the mug load because it tripped this sensor and then it said, whoops, the, the racks are closed again. So it would just get in a loop. Yeah, Sam. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes, good. So yeah, so, so that particular, I mean, we were sloppy by having a single threshold, a deterministic threshold saying that if any sensor was you know, beyond this, because we origi originally, our data was pretty nicely partitioned into the two, and someone just wrote a quick threshold, and we didn't worry about it too much until it showed up in this test. The funny thing is, by the way, that after we saw it in simulation in the nightly tests, um, so, someone said, like, oh, that's never going to happen in reality. And then the very next day, we saw it happen in reality. Just total chance, total chance. But um, yes, so, so there are much more robust ways to write that transition where you would have, let's say, an estimator on the position. You know, like, you'd filter that would be the simplest thing. And that would, be a, a, that would give you a sense of probabilistic reasoning you know, about this. Um, the state machine model is deterministically moving between these different states. Generalizing that to like uh, a belief over different states, that's, that's not as common. Um, but you're right, if thinking more generally about probabilities is, is going to be a better way to go in general. Yes. You had a question? Good. OK. Um, <clears throat> OK. So um, finite state machines actually have a, a rich history in control. My favorite example always has been um, the original hopping robots. This was uh, Mark Raybert who is the, the, one of the founders of Boston Dynamics and now Boston Dynamics AI Institute. He had a lab at MIT um, called the Leg Laboratory. Uh, they started off before they made quadrupeds and the like, they made these hopping robots. Okay, this was one of the, some of the first beautiful dynamic legged locomotion. Very simple, like a pogo stick, but that's a lot like what a robot or a human looks like when it's uh, running, is, is your mass is kind of bouncing like a pogo stick. And I remember, I mean, I spent a lot of my life, I guess. I was going to narrow it, but that I guess it's really my whole life that, uh, that I've been writing fairly complicated uh, you know, optimization-based controllers for things like this. Okay, But Mark's controller was ridiculously simple. He had a simple state machine. He went one way around. And in each side of these, in each, inside each of these states, the controller was actually very simple, typically a linear controller based on directly on the sensor measurement, there's a little bit of filtering in there, okay? And he got very robust performance out. And I always thought, and that was based on his mechanical intuition, I should say his whole lab's mechanical intuition, right? Um, and that always stood out as a sort of a beautiful example of state machines getting robust performance on a real system. But it, it's true here too. So this is um, Andy, uh, uh, who is one of the people programming the spot opening door behavior, right? And they opened a lot of doors, and they saw a lot of counterexamples, and they built, a, it's not exactly a state machine, I think, you know, and, and I don't know exactly what they wrote, but, I, but they went through and understood enough cases, right, where, as you say, even unmodeled things can happen, and the robot gets through the door most of the time, right? This, this <laughs> you know, particularly bad. So they don't probably have a specific state for Andy pulled my cable out of the back of my robot, but, but they have enough robustness and this is real. I mean, so, so people who, I, I like to call them robot whisperers. There are people that can make a robot do just about anything. And typically, the way they've done it, in, at least in the past, is, is by writing state machines, you know, down at the low level, OK? Right? There's um, state machine libraries in ROS. This is a little bit dated one, SMOC, OK? Um, in the, Dish loading, the low level skills were programmed more like the door opening skill for spot, right? So there was a, a small sort of state machine kind of logic, approach the mug so that the mug's in view, then we get a visual servo, then we're going to insert to grasp, right? And Siwan was the main author of this, okay? Um, he, he sat there and he spent enough hours on the robot, he saw all the ways that it, he, they failed, and he improved this sort of state flow logic to the point where it worked almost all the time, right? And that meant changing thresholds of when you transition, you know, maybe filtering some other things. But he, could, he made that system work incredibly well, right? This, the picking up the plate was a particularly subtle one because you had to like nudge your fingers under and wait until you, you know you were at the bottom of the plate when you felt contact, which you actually felt with the, uh, the joint torque sensing and, and it, I mean, some pretty subtle state machine logic there, right? So picking up a plate was approach the plate, 
uh, you know, visual servo for alignment, which is also using ICP, by the way, right? Close the fingers to the right and mount. Insert one tip in the fingers. I mean, he went through and, and got this to be a, a very high level of robustness. Okay? It takes time, engineering time. We're trying to replace all these with learning, learned controllers these days. But even a few years ago, this was the way real robots worked well. Yeah? Um, that's OK, good. Yeah, so this was the in, inside the picking up the skill the skill. Actually, the way that the, it, the reason I didn't think of it that way, but you're absolutely right, but, but um, there was actually a task planner that was composing each of these lower level state machines in that particular example. But you're, you're absolutely right, given what we've said so far, you would think of that as a sub-state in a bigger state machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to end the lecture today saying that language models are going to take over task planning. Yeah, yeah so, so I mean, not completely, maybe, but, uh, but I certainly it's, it's a viable candidate. Yeah, no, I think that these things are changing. Yeah. But this, this is, the, I, I, the, the LLM still has to output something, and uh, it can output a policy or it can output a, a, a plan, right? And so it might actually output things like this. Yeah. It would be hard for an LLM, I, I suspect, as amazing as GPT is, that it would not output something as clever as what C1 earned from uh, you know, months and months of, of effort, of iterations. OK. All right, so um, I won't spend time on it, but I want you to know that there's something called behavior trees. Which, so the problem with finite state machines is that as they get complicated, they explode. Like the, the, as you start adding more and more permutations, the number of discrete modes you need to, to represent complex logic just grows very, very quickly. Okay, so, so actually this, this came up from the computer gaming world, uh, behavior trees. I, I think it has beginnings in something like Rod Brooks' subsumption ar architecture. You could, find, you could find beginnings of it in robotics maybe, but the computer gamers really basically um, generated a different way, maybe a superior way to writing finite state machines that are called these behavior trees. And their, their defining feature is, is that uh, you can kind of grab a, a subsection of a behavior tree and put it in another behavior tree and sort of expect things to compose better. Whereas a finite state machine, really the whole thing, it's kind of a global behavior, um, right? So uh, it has this nice sort of factored representation. And, the control flow basically, every time you go through the behavior tree, every time step, you run through and you kind of check all of the, all the predictions, you know, all, all these things, and you get until something's ready to execute. And you're running through this entire control flow every time until an execution. And it's just a different way to sort of organize your discrete kind of logic. And it's, it, is, um, you know, it is really a computer gaming thing. Like this is how probably the AIs you've fought against and with whatever you know, energy weapons, or you know, are, are probably behave are pro probably programmed uh, with behavior trees. This is right out of the Unreal Engine uh, documentation. Yeah. So, say it again. I think. Uh, So the question is, so maybe you've had experience and you've seen jittering or chattering kind of behavior in behavior trees. I think you could get jittering or chattering in a finite state machine too. You try to not do that, right? I, um, I, under, I agree that with your sentiment that a finite state machine is a little bit more commit, it commits to like being in this state and you could not transition out. Um, it's not non that would that could still be deterministic. You can have chattering in a deterministic system. Both of these, I think, are virtues. Their virtue would be deterministic, you know, playback and the like. 
Yeah, but you can you have in both cases you would have to watch the sensitivity of your of your transitions and the like the noise. Uh, it's possible that this is a little bit more sensitive. Or it's like easier to write a system that chatters, but uh, I don't think that's a defining feature. And you can certainly package up, and people have packaged up behavior trees into a system too. Yeah. How do you make a loop with behavior trees? The loops kind of happen automatically with behavior trees. In some sense, you're you're running down. You're running down. It basically, as long as you get to the same place every time. I mean, uh, but there, I think all of the all the predicates you need to loop forever are certainly available in behavior trees. I would be very surprised if behavior trees were not Turing complete. I haven't seen that proof, but, but I would be very surprised. I mean, everybody has their own version of behavior trees. There's a set of predicates. And so like the behavior tree papers list like you know, 14 different predicates. And then you look at the behavior tree libraries, and they all implement like two. So uh, you could, it's possible you, you could get stuck or something. But I, I think it's a pretty complete specification language. Yeah. Cool. OK, so that's like maybe the most immediate way to turn your, um, your task level logic into a, something that has an answer available every time step. But it doesn't scale to really complicated problems, right? So if you have to make really long-term decisions, if you have to play chess or, or, uh, you know, or win some sort of like strategy game, you're not going to write a finite state machine for that. You need something that does more high-level, long-term reasoning. Okay? And so that's where people tend to stop writing the trees manually and instead write the rules of composition and then rely on AI-based search, for instance, to, to, to chain those compositions into a meaningful action. Right? So how many people have heard, ever heard of STRIPS? The Stanford Research Institute Problem Solver. It's classic, okay? 70-something. Um, so I can define, instead of defining the entire graph, if I define my each sort of nominal action as something, well, first I define the problem as having an initial state, and then I say, what are the goal states? So for instance, all the mugs should be in the, in the top rack. Okay, Those are the situations you're trying to reach. And then you define a set of actions. Right, For each action, you need to define the preconditions, like what are the things that must be true in order to transition into this state, and the post conditions, which are what discrete things are true after the action is performed. Now you don't have to write out an entire, uh, 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 entire state machine by hand. You can actually just use search to, to, to search through the list of actions that you should perform such that you know, a transition is dependent on these preconditions and post conditions, and you find a way through the graph. Right, so this turns task planning into graphs, into search, graph search, if you will. And those low-level actions tend to be robot skills, right? So like in our higher-level task planning, each one of the low-level actions, whether it was pick up a mug or pick up the plate or whatever, we authored a more complex system by saying, if the perception system sees there's a mug on, in the in the dishwasher, and my hand is empty, and all of these sort of discrete predicates, then you can execute this action of picking up the mug. But similarly, if you see a plate, right, and your hand is empty, you could pick up the plate. And if your total task is to get all the mugs into the dishwasher, then you have, to, you have a search problem to decide whether you pick up the mug first, or pick up the plate first, or, or, or you know, have to open the dishwasher door. And you can find a sequence here that gets you to all the way to the goal. Then you can execute the first one, and then replan on the next step. Okay, that tends to be a slightly harder to. Uh, there's a slightly more bring up to sort of define all these skills, but it becomes you much more complicated structures than having to write a big finite state machine. Yeah. Well, I was 
Yeah. Even inside here, uh, we made a somewhat arbitrary decision, maybe to say to have that finite state machine looking thing down at the level of picking up a plate. So there is that FSM at the low level, but we call it at the higher level planning. Uh, we left it just I choose I choose to pick up the plate, and when I choose to pick up the plate, I'm going to do all those things, right? I think it's um, the principles behind making that choice are about the scalability of task planning, the robustness of having fast, low-level decisions. So I think there is a natural place where you put some of your low-level behaviors down into a, a simpler, a higher, you know, like the finite state machine can tend to run faster, for instance, than running a full planner. And we, we tend to leave the higher level uh, things to the planner. Yeah. Absolutely. So people do, so Leslie and Tomas, for instance, uh, at CSAIL, uh, you know, they, uh, they talk about hierarchical planning very, very regularly. Yep. I think that, that can be required to scale to really long term, really complicated tasks. Like if I'm going to plan a trip to Paris, I'm now I'm just going to ask ChatGPT to do it for me. But uh, but <laughs> if I still had to plan a plan trip to Paris, I'm not going to think about like you know how I walk from the terminal to the rental car place, uh, right? First I'm going to decide to fly, you know, what airline I'm going to take, you know, the high level things, and then I'm going to dial it down and figure out the details on the fly. And so I think that sort of hierarchy can really be important. That used to be my example. Like you don't have a you don't have a policy for like planning a trip to Paris. Now GPT at the bottom it has a button that says "Plan a trip to Paris." I'm like, Doo! you know, that was my that was my favorite example of like what you wouldn't just memorize, and then GPT memorized it. Um, yeah, that's how it goes. Okay, so um, so there there's a world of of task level planners. Let me think about how much I I want to say about it here. Okay, so. They started off based primarily on graph search, A star types of algorithms, for instance, D star, incremental sort of graph search. If you've heard about this in a computer science class, for instance. Um, nope. I mean, um, yeah, it's fast. Yeah, so if you interpret that as, I mean, they, they have more advanced heuristics, and I think it's it's lost to the, it's not officially A star, right, in the sense that it doesn't guarantee optimality or anything like this. Yes. Um, right, but I think there's stronger, and you could think of A star as a heuristic based search, okay, but I won't even write that here, but there's um, very strong heuristic based search. For instance, as he says, you'll see algorithms like fast forward, fast downward. And they can solve extremely big graph problems where the graph is even, you never put the graph in memory, okay? And you can instantiate, you can have like object oriented graphs, okay? Um, and they, they solve, in some cases, extremely big problems. And they're very you know, powerful tools. I, I've listed, I put references to most of them in the, most of the most common ones in the notes, right? Um, <clears throat> they typically consume something that looks a lot like the strips language. There's, um, oh, I forgot to list the strips actions for the dishwasher, but those are the strips actions, okay? I'll come back to that in a second here. But <clears throat> um, there's something called padiddle. Uh, some people say PDDL. Some people say padiddle. Every once in a while when I say padiddle, people look at me funny. I'm, I'm not the only one that says that. Uh, OK? And uh, you know, it's basically as, uh, the same sort of preconditions, postconditions. But it has the ability to, to have a, a precondition, like an action could be defined with a, with a symbol of an object. Like I could have the same action defined and it could be instantiated for move a mug or move a plate or move whatever. And you can author this, the, the action once 
and have it bound to a symbol only at planning time, for instance. They also, more recent versions of Padiddle um, handle temporal logic constraints. You can say, you know, you must eventually put the mug in the, in the, the sink or get it out of the sink, things like this. Okay? But it's mostly the idea, the most important idea is that it's um, a generalization of the strips idea. Yeah, and to see how that all played out in the, in the dish loading, we really just have this you know, precondition. Given the current state of the world, you, could, you say true or false, is this skill currently viable? You ask, you, we also have the notion of a cost, okay, but then you say, after I run that skill, what are the possible outcomes, right? And then I can execute the skill. And these are the different skills that we planned across when we were loading the dishwasher. So each one of those defined its preconditions, its postconditions. And we had our discrete state in this planner was this, was things like how many um, clean items are there to put away? How many dirty items are there in the dishwasher, right? And, and all, all the sort of tracking that you need to do on the discrete state of the task. Importantly, these planners run, um, have to keep running. So you pl plan once, it might take even a second or something to run a, a big complicated plan, but you need to keep rerunning re the plan in order to, to get some level of robustness. So when we were like antagonizing the robot, you know, it's halfway through, it saw that something changed, and it went back and replanned, set the mug down, went back through and pulled the dish rack out again. It would have been a big state machine to, hit, to get the level of robustness that we got out of that sort of a planning system. That's a mean thing to say to a robot person. <laughs> uh, the, the, um, I would say that the, uh, the, he asked why it's so slow, if, it, if anybody didn't hear. Um, yeah, I think there's lots of reasons. I think the, sometimes there's, the thing I don't like is the, there's pauses because it was planning, right? And those should be gone. Like, I, I, I'm not happy when I see a robot pause, right? Also because the motors could heat up or something. But um, not on that robot that's got brakes. But, um, yeah, I mean, we moved conservatively. We didn't want to throw mugs. Uh, there are velocity limits on the, the KUKA can't move super fast. If you want to start throwing darts or, or rocks, or um, yeah, Mike threw uh, rocks for his project and uh, when he took the class and he's like, how do I turn off every limit in the EWA model? Because he couldn't, he couldn't throw it fast enough. So there's limits in the hardware, yeah. Yes? Uh, in that case, the task was no longer, that, that skill was no longer possible because the dishwasher rack got closed and it had a mug in its hand. So in order to complete, it actually had to set down the mug and go back and do it. In an ideal world, it would continue. I think we probably had some thresholds here that, you know, that, that, it might have had a you know, bifurcation of behavior somewhere in the middle there, but I think in the ideal world, there's nothing about the framework that could, would prevent it from finishing the task in an elegant way. Yeah? Yeah? Good question. How often do you need to replan? So I would say replan as fast, as often as possible, and that, and that it becomes dominated by the cost of planning, right? So we tended to plan either at the, um, you know, at the com conclusion of any task, we would always plan then. Um, and that one obviously planned in the, in the middle too. So um, yeah, we would plan at about a one hertz or something like that. And that was limited by the speed of the planning. Yeah. Good. Um, so people have very different opinions about what you should do. And then historically, there's been kind of a debate against the people who like to build big planners and people who like to write more solid state machines and uh, famously Rod Brooks had paper, a paper saying elephants don't play chess. Like you should be able to get very robust behavior without writing a big complicated logic planner, right? Um, and uh, the success of that 
line of work was the Roomba, actually. That's like, I mean, he did many more things than the Roomba, but the Roomba was sort of shockingly good and robust in real homes using just another, a complicated state machine, if you will. It was more like a behavior tree uh, than a state machine. Okay, but then came large language models, right? So I, it's pretty funny, because last year, uh, when I talked about this kind of planning, similar, it was like about you know, October or something in, in the middle of the year, uh, this wasn't a thing yet. Actually, Boyan came and gave a talk, uh, like I sort of finished one of the lectures saying, like, there's this thing called large language models. They're coming soon. You're going to see them soon. And then just bam, you know, like <laughs> you know, our world got changed, right? Um, so for fun, let me tell you about a couple of experiments about how far language models can go with, with in terms of generating plans, OK? So um, Charlie and a few folks at TRI did, just did some, some sort of experiments saying, like, could we replace our task level planners and just ask GPT, right? And uh, so the task here, this is a, the dual arm home cart, we, call, we called it. Um, the task in this particular sort of storyboard is just scooping with the spatula these vegetables and get them into the bin, OK? And uh, the question is, can GPT figure out all of the task level planning for us? And here's how it goes, right? So there's a lot of work in prompt engineering. I'll show you a little bit, uh, a little bit of that. Can people see this? OK, you, let me, that was maybe too fast. Let me just say the first thing here. OK, so you're a robot with two grippers. You're positioned in front of a table, so you got to have to give it some context, OK? Um, but specifically, you say, you have the following set of actions listed below, right? Dump into container, pick up the spatula, and you have to restrict the output into things that the robot knows how to do, OK? Um, and that, that's actually a very, the, the prompt is actually about a page and a half. Uh, the first prompt, okay, just sort of giving the context to GPT. And then at every plan, you say, okay, in the current state, you're not holding the chopper, you're not holding the spatula, you don't know the location of the bin, you don't know the locations of the carrots. Please tell me a, a sequence of actions that will transfer into the bin. And it actually, you have to say very carefully, I want you to tell, say your output, you know, in this format, using exactly those actions, right, and nothing more. OK, it, it always explains itself, right? Actually, when we did this experiment initially, it, ex it was succinct. Now I get like a page and a half of, uh, of justification. But then you get a, like a very reasonable list of actions to execute which at first glance is not so different than what you might get if you called graph plan or fast downward or something like this. And it really does ask, it beg the question of, you know, do, we, do we still want to do AI search or can we just memorize or you know, have, have a next word prediction system that has read everything on the internet, you know, solve task planning for us, okay? What's Super interesting about this is I'll just let it run here, and you'll see a couple different examples here. Is it start? We start then executing those list of plans sequentially. Now these skills were state machine hand engineered at the time. We've replaced most of them with learned skills now, but. You see the little running annotation at the bottom. This one's slower still. Okay. In the current state, you're holding the chopper, you're holding the spatula, you did not know the location of the bin. Anyways, so you update it with the state of the world, okay? Ask it for the next plan. My God, if it doesn't give pretty good, pretty reasonable plans out. And what's even more interesting here is there's cases that are about to come up here where the skill fails, OK? Uh, 
That one succeeded. Let's wait for the failure here. And by the way, one of the skills is to replan. It can ask itself to replan, okay? It says, since some carrots are still on the table, here's a sequence of actions that will transfer. I think this is the one that failed. Yeah, the gather skin skill failed, okay? So basically, we told it that the skill failed, and then it came up with a new plan that didn't use that skill. Okay, let me just take a second to reflect on. So if you have a, a strips-based or some you know, search-based planner, and you want to just say that skill failed, it, it's actually not easy to sort of go in there and say, oh, there's a little change that happened. Uh, and, and cause it to take a different path. <coughs> These optimizing planners are going to very consistently find the same solution every time. <coughs> right? And um, it's extremely elegant to me, the fact that you can just sort of say, oh, that changed, and it, 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 it accounts for that and comes up with a different plan. Right? Similarly, in a search-based planner, if you forget to say something, if you forget to list a constraint or a precondition or a postcondition, it's very easy for your search-based planner to exploit your omission, right? I mean, maybe you didn't say that dishes should arrive at the dishwasher unbroken, right? So you could just go, you know, and then put it in the dishwasher, right? There's really, if you didn't say it, there's no rule against it, okay? And the language models have a sense of, I mean, I'll, I'll use the word common sense. Right? They're able to take much more partial specifications and give very reasonable plans out. And that is, I think, the most exciting thing about, about what we're seeing here. It's not that we couldn't have done this otherwise, but that's, that's the thing that we definitely couldn't have done before. We never had this sort of common sense background utility sort of capability before. Yeah? <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. Um, the, the balloon gripper is a, is a visual tactile sensor. In there, so we, the, um, if you use a rigid gripper and you're trying, to, you don't know exactly where that, that knife thing is, and you shove it down, because you need to have good contact with the ground, otherwise you'll miss the carrots, for instance, right? But if you jam it down too hard, you'll hurt your robot or something. So having a compliant interface there and some force sensing directly at the end effector um, justified using, uh, we solved that problem. It wasn't working at all until we put the bubbles in there. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a fair question. So LLMs aren't super fast. I mean, part of that is just writing. It's verbose explanation, uh, you know, uh, right? It's like, okay, just tell me the answer. I don't need, you know, you know. But um, uh, I, I don't, I mean, that's, that's a problem today. Like, next week it'll be fine, right? Uh, isn't that, I mean, I, uh, there's, there's so much fast, okay, boy. Is that right? Yeah, so I just to summarize that quickly, so yeah, so, so you, can, you can do few shot prompting and get it to give more concise answers, and uh, you can fine tune models, you know, possibly that wouldn't require massive, or you could, you know, take the llama, you know, open source models and, and optimize the heck out of them. I think people are making fast progress on that. Yeah. Yep. Good. So, so the question there, so if, if the actions you had were parametric, and particularly if they have continuous variables, so then you leave task planning and you enter the world of task and motion planning, or there's various uh, 
formulations of this, but you know, if you do mixed, continuous, and discrete things, one of the places that shows up in robotics here would be task and motion planning, where you're jointly solving those. Um, you said GPT can't do that. I don't know, actually. You know, they, I've seen some surprisingly good um, things uh, out of that. But uh, we'll talk about, we'll, we'll, if you guys pick it, we could have a whole lecture on task and motion planning. There's a lot of nice ways to combine the discrete and the continuous. That's one of the boutique lectures we could pick later. Traditionally, when I say task planning, yeah, I would mean just as a discrete. Yep, and it's a harder problem if you try to mix the two. You've jumped a complexity class. OK, so I made most of the points there. But, but I think the robustness um, and the common sense aspects are, are fantastically good. Yeah? I was, so you're, you're exactly right. So one of the things here, which I think is my next slide, uh, I'll skip ahead for a second here, but yeah, so that demonstration still required symbol grounding, right? So you either need a perception system or a human. I think in that particular first, that was just a toy example we were playing with. Charlie was sitting next there saying like, you now have carrots, you know, and we don't want Charlie in the loop, uh, you know, in the long run here. Uh, but he summarized the state of the environment and the plan, he, plan only reasoned about the discrete states and actions, right? Um, Again, that one seems like uh, is just a matter of time. And ironically, you know, probably maybe everybody, I don't know, but this morning I finally, everybody's been talking about, oh, I got access to GPT-4V. And I was like, ah, I'm waiting, I'm still waiting. It's, I don't know. And this morning I got access. So you're lucky I have a lecture at all, because I could have like just been played with GPT-4V all, all, all day. But the, I immediately uh, walked over and, uh, and I wanted to try it, right? So I just, this is like the messiest part of the lab right now. It's kind of next to the whiteboard. I said, I need to claim the whiteboard. Can you give me step-by-step -step instructions using these objects? I didn't say anything about there's a eraser, there's a whatever, right? I just said, I just took a picture, right? Historically, the visual language models, I would say, if I were just summarize them in one line, I would say that they work incredibly well on Flickr data and less well on robot data. And I don't think we know yet. I mean, people are just getting access to this now, but it seems I've seen some success stories. I've also seen some people say it's not that great, but, but um, most people say it's great. So it came out and said, certainly, you know, um, <laughs> here's a step-by-step -step guide to clean the whiteboard using the items. It knows, like, pretty sophisticated stuff. It, it saw the Lysol, like, by brand, right? Um, it's giving me things. I, I would never actually be as careful as it asks me to be, but it's pretty subtle uh, description of what the task could be. At the down of the, you know, don't push too hard, um, right? Ensure that you're not applying too much pressure. This will help in removing the, the marker stains, <sighs> right? Pretty darn good. OK, so, the, so maybe one question is, are the LLMs capable? And I'm curious what you guys think. You know, the, are the LLMs capable of solving the hard you know, could, could an LLM play Go? I would think most people would say no. Uh, I would, you know, wait a week or something, you know, but, uh, <laughs> um, but people are doing more and more complicated long-term planning with LLMs via clever prompting. I don't know if you've seen this chain of thought and tree of thoughts kind of logic, but if you, if you prompt the, the LLM, to be methodical in its, its search-like in its reasoning, then the output tends to be stronger at search-based problems. Um, so it's kind of changed. You know, the, the world has changed to like prompt engineering almost instead of uh, search algorithms. Let's see. Yeah. There's been research in that front. Uh, you should ask Ishan if, you, if you're curious. He's, he's done some of it. Um, yes. So, um, so Yilun Du is uh, in CSAIL as a graduate student. 
I, I remember having a conversation with him about something like this, and he, he says, language makes everything better, even like physics-based reasoning. You just put in language and everything gets better. And I believe him, roughly. I think there's, there's, uh, there's something amazing in, that's been encoded in, in these models, and I think, uh, I think connecting them down to actions. I think there's a missing ingredient in the internet-scale data of, of data that has lots of physical interactions, and you probably need some amount of robot data to be you know, dexterous and, and good, but I think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about combining that data with the internet scale data, whether it's language, whether it's Flickr, uh, and getting something better than you get from either any of them independently. Yes? So people are thinking about this, uh, for sure. Like the whole world is aiming for this, which is, just to say it again for the microphone, is that um, can you do a large, large model for robotics, let's say. Uh, we have one that we call large behavior models at, at TRI. Um, people talk about foundation models for decision making and control. There's a, there's a NeurIPS workshop last year and this year about this. Lots of people, Chelsea Finn is giving a talk uh, uh, tomorrow probably about this. I think Aloha is part of her, her talk. The, um, yes, the world is aiming for this. Uh, the question is, you know, about the scaling laws and do we need, we can't generate as much robot data as GPT was able to ingest in text data. So that's why I think the connections to the existing data set, finding ways to have a little bit of robot data combined with a lot of image data on the, online, um, is the, the fastest way to get to something better. Eventually, we'll have boatloads of robot data, but getting off the ground is, is a big step. Cool, let me just, I think I just have one. Um, so uh, I won't talk about this, I guess, but it, robots like to, or LLMs like, are really good at Python. Sometimes you should consider, instead of asking it to output a domain-specific language, let it write Python for you. That's, it's read a lot of Python on GitHub. Um, right? Okay, so just to summarize then, so um, there's a pr paradigm that most people are used to in procedural codes. How does this all fit together, right? Um, you can still use that, but you break the system's uh, abstraction and you do something like message passing. We talked about state machines, behavior trees, um, task planning, where you use online replanning planning in order to have an answer at every time step. And then when we talked about LLMs, really, I should, um, I guess the thing I didn't say in the code is policies, but you can, the example I gave was potentially, was generating plans from the LLM, but if you let it write Python code for you, you can potentially output a state machine type logic for you too. Now, their ability to write a, you know, Boston Dynamics level or Roomba level state machine is probably uh, limited, right? I think it's not yet clear how far that will go but I would not bet against it. <laughs> okay, good, fun. Uh, yeah, see you next time. Yeah.